I will share screen and I will uh, give you my talk and I'll be very curious to hear what you all uh, to receive your input. Um, so um, so uh, my theme is that risk communication should be strategic and not an afterthought. Um, yes, okay. And uh, uh, as an overview, I'd like to talk about why science is needed for science and risk communication, what science is needed for science and risk communication, and how we can mobilize that the needed science. Uh, so first topic. So why is the science needed? Uh, scientists are generally excellent communicators when talking to their students, their family, and their friends that occurs in situations where scientists have people's bas basic trust, they know what interests their audience, so they can tailor the content of their message. They know what their audience already knows, so they don't talk down to them or talk over their head. They get good feedback. Uh, if people don't understand, they'll tell you. If your students don't understand, they will get the questions right on, your, on, the, on the test. And you have a chance to try again if you haven't got it right. However, when scientists communicate with the general public, they may not have that basic trust. They may not know what interests their audience. They may not know what their audience already knows. They may not get good feedback because they're speaking at a distance. And they may not have a chance to try again. Once you lose people's trust, it's hard to get it back. And scientists also may have competition with other sources talking about their topics that are less well-informed, less well-intended, insulated in their own echo chambers and cacophonic where there's lots of people saying different different things leaving the public without a coherent message the science of science and risk communication can help scientists to compete in this uh, information uh, environment we need a scientific approach to communication because people that's all of us have faulty intu intuitions about how well they understand other people and vice versa, that is how well other people understand them. As a result, people often communicate poorly and then blame their audience. Uh, much of social psychology, which some of you may, may have taken, is built around corollaries of this general observation. So here are some of the effects you might have learned in a, a social psychology 101 course, as it would be called in this country. The common knowledge effect, as an example, is a belief the things that we know, other people know, because they seem so obvious to them. And if we mistakenly believe that, then we may fail to tell people things that they, that they need to know, that we need to fill in the gaps, and we leave them puzzled or making false uh, inferences. So what is the science that is needed for that that will fill this gap and support the natural intuitions of scientists. So all communications involve content, which is what is said, and process, which is how it is said. Uh, content and process affect one another. If you have sound content, it increases trust in the speaker. If you have sound process, it increase, increases trust in the content. And conversely, poor content and process undermine one thing, say good, say the right things, but in an untrustworthy way, un disrespectful way, they'll be dis, dis, uh, uh, discounted. Talk to people who trust you in a nice way, but fail to address their information needs. It's going to undermine their trust in you because you're somebody who doesn't understand them. So a sound process, according to the research, engages stakeholders in respectful two-way communication in order to get the right facts, as well as get the facts right. Uh, here's a model. There are many pictures like this. This is one that I, I like for sound process. So in the middle, you have a, kind of a conventional risk management uh, scheme. You start with an idea. You develop it, eventually implement it, and, and, monitor, and monitor it. And in this conceptualization, actually it comes from a Canadian uh, 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 publication uh, organization, there's two-way risk communication throughout the process. So at the very beginning, the people who are managing the risk, whatever it is, talk to their audience, tell them what they're doing, and listens to their audience, to their public, and finds out what interests them so that they 
create the data that are needed to address public concerns so they can be judged uh, fairly. And this two-way communication continues all the way through the process. The process, complex projects necessarily involve, of, evolve. If you don't stay in contact with your public, then you may be, think that you're solving the same problem, but will have lost them uh, along the way. Uh, here's one uh, 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 call for better processes, a, a report from 25 years ago from a uh, committee of our National Academy of Sciences looking at environmental uh, environmental justice. And uh, I was on this committee, we visited with, uh, had a number of site visits with affected communities, and um, two of our three recommendations had to do with, one of our recommendations had to do with content, which was improve the science base. The other two had to do with process, that it's important to evolve, involve the affected community throughout the process, and then second is to communicate the findings to all the stakeholders, as we observe that often well-meaning scientists would go to community, take observations, and never be heard from again. And so the communities naturally were deprived of that information and wondered who the scientists were working for. To have, creating a sound, a, a sound process like that requires commitment. This requires some uh, strategic commitment to talking to people all the way. It doesn't require a lot of material resources. It often requires time and a willingness to listen and to change course if needed to address public concern. It requires coordination within and across organizations. If anybody, any scientists alienate the public, all scientists uh, pay, pay, the, pay the price. And it requires confidence that there will be return on this investment, that if we listen to the, talk to the public, that uh, we will all collectively be, be better off. Uh, not hard to find stumbles in the communication process, at least in this country. I think communications about pandemic prevention and treatment have been a continuing disaster. The disaster was the front page topic in the New York Times uh, late, late that week. Nuclear power, uh, genetically modified crops, Large solar arrays are now running in, in this country. I believe you have a similar issue in, uh, in Chile that are running into local, local opposition, which may or may not be legitimate, but is, but is um, aggravated by poor communication. Autonomous vehicles, you can go on. This is, in some ways, bad communication is almost the norm with insulated uh, scientific uh, communities. How do you get the content right? This is the model that, uh, that people like myself who approaches from a decision science or behavioral decision research perspective adopt. You first have to analyze the problems to find what information, what facts are most relevant to your audience, which may not be the facts that are of greatest interest to you and your science. Uh, descriptive research, find out what people already know. Create interventions that, that may address the information uh, uh, gaps, evaluate how well you're doing, and then repeat until you have found the information that people need and have uh, conveyed it uh, to them, in including perhaps the uncertainty. You may not have the information, but telling people that is part of communication. Uh, we have pursued, our, our working group has pursued this general strategy in a wide variety of situations. Um, xenotransplantation was in the news uh, yesterday with the transplantation of a pig uh, heart into a somebody who was too sick for a human heart uh, heart tra transplant. So very general methodologies can be used in a variety of ways. So these applications of the science draw on a small core of analytical methods. Here are some of them that they will be probably some of them will be familiar to everybody in the, uh, in the audience. If you master those analytical methods, you can find the, the one or have somebody who can do it for you. You can analyze what information people need. Here's an example. Here's a, a project that we did on pandemic disease uh, in 2005, where the pandemic of interest was uh, avian flu or H5N1. We organized a consultation and communication around this influence diagram, which is a uh, like a Bayesian belief network or influence diagram. Here's the factors that affect the effectiveness of pharmacological in interventions. This is the science that you would need to have on your team in order to design an appropriate intervention. 
and uh, and and to give your audience a um, a clearer picture. Here is a model of the the factors affecting the uh, the effectiveness of behavioral interventions like distancing, space ma uh, face masks, uh, mandates of various sorts. It's as you might imagine, because we're dealing with people and and social institutions and not just biological process. It's a much more complicated process, and people in your audience may legitimately want to know that you know about each of these uh, these things. These applications of the science, they draw on a modest suite of empirical methods. For those who've studied social science, you probably will have learned some or, or, all, of, or all of these. Here's an example of, a, of an empirical study uh, for people unfamiliar with the social science. This was part of the, uh, the uh, H5N1 pandemic process for which we did the analysis. Uh, we had opportunity to survey uh, a group of about two dozen public health experts and two dozen technology experts of the sort who would keep the world going during during a uh, during a pandemic. Before the meeting, we asked them questions uh, about how what they thought the probability was of that virus becoming tra transmissible. We produced a histogram of what did the public health experts, that's the black, believe the risk to be? Most of them thought the chance was about 10%. Some of them thought it was higher. We asked these technology uh, experts who are some of the best, some very well-known in, in individuals, and most of them thought that the probability was much higher than most of the experts did. So that's, uh, that's the state of knowledge coming into this meeting. And one of the things that we considered in the meeting is why why, you know, why does the public, as represented by these technology experts, uh, uh, accept the view, is, why are their views closer to the minority of experts than the majority of, ec of experts? And once you know that, you can begin to design uh, in, in interventions. Uh, I won't go into this, but part of the science of these interventions, of these, of part of the science here is to see how robust people's beliefs are. You ask people a question, they'll give you an answer, if only to make you give, go away. But here we want to know how seriously could we take their probabilities. So we ask the same question in two different ways and look for the internal, uh, internal uh, consistency. Uh, the applications draw on a large bodies of research on, on how to co communicate specific topics. So how do you communicate numerical estimates, which are part of many, many risks? How do you communicate exponential processes, like the unintuitive ways in which disease rates at which disease is spread? How do you communicate the physical processes involved? Uh, how do you communicate un, 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 uncertainty? All of this is embedded, these, these specific, in a very wide, I mean, all of the social sciences, social behavioral sciences, what we know about humans, uh, behavior. About 10 years ago, the late Ralph Cicerone, who was president of our National Academy of Sciences and was a leading uh, climate scientist, became concerned about why climate science had such difficulty telling its message and, and asked me and a couple of other people to convene three uh, National Academy workshops on the sciences of science communication in which we brought leading people together to explain their science in terms that scientists could interpret. And we have three special issues of the proceedings of, of the National Academy of Sciences. They're all available. I think everything that I have here has URLs that are available for people who are for free download if people are interested in, in, in reading more. Our Food and Drug Administration has a risk communication advisory committee that about that I chaired for its first few years that has a similarly directed uh, guide summarizing the science on different topics in short 3,000 word uh, chapters also available for free download. Though critical to all this, this is very complicated, there's a lot of science out there, it doesn't give you ironclad answers to any question, all content for messages needs testing. So no one's intuitions can be trusted with diverse audiences presenting unfamiliar material. 
minimal testing with what we call think aloud protocols is fast and inexpensive. So there's no excuse for not doing it. And these think aloud protocols is minimal testing almost always produces surprises that improve uh, in communication content. What is, what is this minimal testing? Just ask a few people from the target audience to read a draft aloud saying whatever comes to their mind uh, about what is, the, what is in the message, what is missing and how it, how it sounds. It's really easy. It always produces surprises. It's rarely done for, for the reasons cited earlier. People exaggerate how well they communicate. So how do we mobilize this science? Uh, let me give some, I'll give some examples in the pandemic uh, area. So Larry Brilliant is a co-author of the, those earlier papers and who organized that H5N1 meeting has been, well, actually has been working on pandemic disease for his whole life. He's one of the people involved in eradication of, of smallpox for the last 15 years has run an organization called uh, Ending, Ending Pandemics that had a lot in place moved some and, and was, I think, did work that was not taken fully advantage of. We knew a lot that we didn't use. Um, in November of 2016, I helped to organize a, a meeting of our National uh, Academy on uh, raise, building communication capacity to counter infectious disease threats. It was a great meeting, have people from all over the world. We had some leading uh, people in, in, in uh, public health and nothing happened. So we had no communicate, at least in this country, no risk communication capacity uh, ready. Our National Academy was more responsive once the pandemic broke. It created a standing committee on, on this and other infectious disease that I'm, that I'm, that I'm, I'm part of. The first, uh, it learned our National Academy take, typically takes a year to three to produce a report. It learned under duress how to figure out how to produce reports in 10 days. The first one that I worked on was on, they call it a rapid expert uh, consultation on the effectiveness of fabric face masks uh, for relevant to the pandemic. It wasn't hard to write because there was almost no, oh, no, no research. Uh, it has turned out to be the most down, <laughs> among the most downloaded uh, of publications uh, for the for the National Academy. It's about eight pages, eight pages long, and we had two messages. One is that there is limited evidence on effectiveness. Here's a screenshot from the report, and we tried to make it very clear that li that limited evidence on effectiveness is not evidence of limited effectiveness. We just there's no money in fabric face masks. <laughs> Nobody had studied it. And uh, we just didn't just didn't know. And the second thing, second point we make: don't speculate about behavior. Uh, we um, because people have folk wisdom. In this case, the folk wisdom cut in two was contradictory. One one set of folk wisdom had it that if people wore face masks, they would stop doing. They would not do anything else because they had checked the box for preventive behavior. The other bit of folk wisdom was that uh, was that once people started wearing face masks, that protective behavior would become part of their identity, and they would do uh, they would begin they would do everything uh, following that uh, following that. That both will happen for some people under some conditions, um, but there were people advocating either proposing or opposing face masks based entirely on a simplistic uh, simplistic theory. So don't speculate collect, uh, do the research. Uh, I had the opportunity to, in the summer of 2020 to be on our National Academy Committee uh, on the equity the that advised the federal government, the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control Prevention on, on equitable allocation of COVID-19 uh, vac uh, vaccine. We produced a chart, was, this chart was widely known in this country of a phased introduction that was of what were the groups that we thought uh, were priorities. We were do, the, the report came out in October 2nd, 2020. So this was before we actually knew we had vaccines. Uh, vaccines. The committee, uh, one of the best committees I've ever, ever, ever been on, uh, had a strong commitment to transparency. So to ensure that the framework is equitable and is seen as equitable, uh, it's my bold. Uh, the committee designed it to be easily understood by diverse audiences. 
reliably translated into operational terms and to distinguish scientific and ethical judgment. So we were willing to sacrifice sophistication in the scheme in order to make certain that it was transparent so people knew why things were happening and that, that diverse groups could apply it and check the work of the people who were applying it. So we ended up with four, we adopted four relatively straightforward and simple characteristics by which we set the priorities in that colored phase uh, sl a slide, the risk of acquiring infection, the risk of severe morbidity and mortality, risk of negative societal impact, and the risk of transmitting inf infection to others. And uh, I worked on this, other members of the committee did the difficult work of, of, uh, of, tra of, of translating available data into terms that allowed deriving actual, uh, actual priorities. The committee also had a commitment, explicit commitment to communication. In fact, it had two of its eight chapters were dedicated to communication. So one was risk communication and community engagement, which, uh, who's, which was talked about what is the science and the commitment for, to provide the facts that people need in order to feel respected, make personal choices, evaluate uh, programs and understand the rationale of those programs. So that's just the facts that people need. And there was a separate chapter on health promotion whose goal was to provide, to, to summarize the science and how to provide official recommendations through trustworthy channels, along with the resource for people to act, act on them so that we were not asking people to do the impossible given their life, uh, Life, life circumstances, and we made a strong case that these needed to be there need to be a firewall between these two enterprises. That if you give giving if you mix in advice with the facts, people perhaps justifiably think that you're spinning the facts in order to justify the recommendations. On the other hand, if you provide if people basically understand the science, they're more likely to accept the recommendation. Conversely, if they know that you're going to provide recommendations and not leave them adrift, then, then they know how to, they're, they're more comfortable uh, uh, absorbing the facts. The committee also had a, a commitment to strategic organization of its communication activities. At, that it, it was a combination of a top-down and a bottom-up approach. We recommended national coordination that somebody perhaps CDC, perhaps FDA, perhaps a unique body would gather and analyze the risk and inf relevant information. That is, what is our cumulative knowledge about the effectiveness of face masks uh, or the, the risks from uh, surfaces? Uh, surfaces. What is, the, what is our cumulative knowledge of, of uh, vaccine safety and effectiveness? And, and, effectiveness? and that this national body would create and test message prototypes that drew on the sciences of science communication. So, so that we would be talking about these things in common terms that people understood. And there would then be community partners who would adapt the message to local conditions. We cited historical, uh, historical black colleges and universities, uh, school nurse associations, uh, uh, faith-based organizations who would be trusted by their local community would know how to speak these terms, how to, how to give these messages in terms that people would understand, would address their cultural sensitivities and so on. And conversely would report on their experience on an emerging issue so that CDC or FDA or, or whoever, whoever would know what information is needed, where they're trusted and, and, and where not. So you would have this ongoing two-way communication. So had this been done, this, our country would have had something like this sound uh, process. Uh, it didn't happen and still hasn't, that hasn't happened. Uh, here, uh, earlier this, or I guess, or early, uh, in April of 2021, we wrote a report on the continuing failures to communicate uh, vaccine effectiveness, efficacy, efficacy effectiveness and equity it basically reiterated the, the conclusions from the, from, the, from the previous report. I don't think we've made much progress there as well. One of the reasons why we haven't made progress is that there was that, um, that 
that we did not have in place a federal coordinating organization. So in this country, uh, the unhappy, clumsy term is the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures Enterprise. So this was a, a FEMCHI, as it's called. So FEMCHI as uh, the acronym, uh, was created under the George W. Bush administration to deal, to provide coordinated response to biological warfare, uh, weapons of mass destruction. It was expanded unto, to the, in, in the Obama administration after experiences with H1N1 to, to deal with, 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 with pandemics. It had actually 2016 quite a nice um, a pandemic playbook that would have done many of the things that that our committee uh, recommended, and it was uh, it was ineffective in the um, in 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 the current pandemic. And uh, I was on the, a committee that reported out about two months ago on how it is that we would reestablish this uh, uh, reestablish FEMSHI to do the coordination that the information gathering and dissemination uh, requires. So in conclusion, the more science you know about uh, communicating risks uh, and, and science, the better. If you don't know that science, ask someone who does the basic lessons here. You know, Everybody knows a professor has been in the class, has somebody in their family, has somebody who's taken a public health course in it. And uh, so don't trust your intuition. And then, Test everything before you use it. The testing is easy and, and cheap, really no excuse for not doing it. And uh, here are a few references if, uh, if you're interested. So uh, thank you. <laughs>